But we're, um, so yeah, my name is Paddy Johnson. I am one of the co-founders of Good Comics. We are a small press um, based in the UK. We've been going for uh, um, almost six years now. Um, we publish, you know, a very a small number of books each year, but we also do distribution um, for people around the world, some people from other countries. But um, Ernesto reached out to us saying, um, were we interested in this book? And I said, yeah, it's great. But we, um, so we agreed to distribute it for him. And I'm really, really happy that we could do that because it's, um, you know, for me, as, as someone who helps to get comics out there, I think it's, you know, it's really important that people are reading work like this that is really different and really unique. And we're going to hear a lot of perspectives tonight on why this book is unique and why this book is interesting. But, um, you know, I, I think it's really important that comics provide, you know, social commentary, but also to do it through a historical and literary lens is something that I really, really love. So I'm really, really happy that we could get this book out there. And um, obviously, I'm also really, really happy that Ernesto has put together a panel of amazing comic scholars and artists and uh, also me. Um, but just to give you a little bit of um, info on everyone, we have um, a number of different people who are going to go around and say what their favorite comic from the book is um, and why. And then we're gonna have a little bit of a discussion. We have, a, sorry, we'll have a little presentation from everyone just for a few minutes from all of our panelists. And then afterwards, hopefully we can have a bit of a chat and there'll be time for Q and A um, at the end. So if you have any questions, um, save them till the end and we'll be able to answer them then. Um, but to introduce our panelists, um, so first up, we have Martin Paul Eve. Martin Paul Eve is Professor of Literature, Technology and Publishing at Birkbeck University of London and Visiting Professor of Digital Humanities at Sheffield Hallam University. He is the author of nine books, a winner of the Philip Leverhulme Prize and the KU Leuven Medal of Honor in the Humanities and one of the Shaw, Shaw Trust's 100 Most Influential Disabled People in the UK. Um, and next up, we'll then have Anna Feigenbaum. Anna Feigenbaum is Professor in Communication and Digital Media in the Department of Communication and Journalism at Bournemouth University. And um, for Anna, her bio says, social change is inseparable from critical thinking and compassionate communication. And um, beyond the university, she runs a variety of workshops on data storytelling for local businesses, NGOs, and community groups. Um, and then next up, we will have Francisco de la Mora, who is a comics creator, illustrator, and designer based in London, in the UK. Um, Francisco designed the Lockdown Chronicles and he also leads Symbola Comics, an initiative that creates open access multilingual comics for research, advocacy, public engagement and developing impact. And I believe I just heard he has two graphic novels out this week, so hopefully we can hear some more about those later as well. Um, next up, we have uh, Dr. Natalia Perez, who is an early modernist in the Latin American and Iberian Cultures Department at the University of Southern California, who's been uh, kind enough to join us all the way from sunny L.A. today. Um, her interests include performance and spectacle from the late Middle Ages to contemporary horror cinema and gore. Um, her work is informed by contemporary and early modern theories on sound, voice and music. And last but not least, of course, is Dr. Ernesto Priego, author of the Lockdown Chronicles and senior lecturer, lecturer at the Centre for Human Computer Interaction Design, City University of London. And he is co-founder and co-editor of the Comics Grid, the Journal of Comics Scholarship and the author of many, many publications, the latest of which is, of course, the Lockdown Chronicles. So that's everyone. Um, first of all, we're going to hear from Martin. Um, now, Martin, I will share my screen so we can see what your favourite strip is from the book. Thanks so much, uh, Paddy and Ernesto, for bringing us all together and to everyone for giving up your evenings on this um, turning autumnal night here in uh, the UK. So I'm going to just say a few framing words as well about the, the Lockdown Chronicles, how I read it, its status as an art form versus an act of social commentary, and then we can move on to, to my particular strip that I've chosen. I guess the first thing to note is that we, we often see um, aesthetic responses to catastrophe. Um, dystopian fiction is, in my, to my mind, one of the core forms through which we see this and where we see... Uh, artists coming to try to paint uh, a vision of a bleak world or a better world and somehow both of these phenomena utopian and dystopian uh, fictions reflect back to critically examine the world as it is so utopian and dystopian forms are not so dissimilar from one another the lockdown chronicles is slightly different to that because it's not having to imagine a world that has dystopian characteristics it was very much a reflection on a world that actually had those characteristics in our present moment. 
And so there's something strange about the the time period with which the lockdown chronicles had to deal that is different to somehow what other you know warnings about the future might might bring to us. The warnings of the lockdown chronicles were the warning that we needed right now and that we were having to deal with in our present. I think also, though, that we should remember that this is an artistic response. And it's going to be very easy this evening, I think, for us to slide seamlessly between talking about the pandemic and talking about the comics collection that Ernesto has put together that convey information about that pandemic. And these two things are not uh, co-identical. They're not the same thing. Um, there's something about the form here that is deliberately supposed to take us out of the news cycle, even while it's presenting factual information in the same style as we get through the um, increasingly alarming news reports that we'd see every day. And that's what I think is quite interesting and playful about this collection is the way that it manages to refract back um, the data of the news cycle to us through historical and artistic lenses in a new form that we're used to seeing as a form of consumptive entertainment, but that is somehow giving us quite a bleak uh, set of statistical um, observations often. So I'm, I'm going to then fall into my own trap and segue seamlessly between the pandemic and the art form that, that is documenting it when I, I note that I am one of those clinically vulnerable individuals who is still in lockdown and has felt the effects of the lockdowns over the past year very acutely. Um, for me, Ernesto publishing these comics online in serialized form was both a nod to the history of the novel form, which was originally a serialized form, and the fact that stories do unfold in serial installments rather than in continuous blocks that we can binge watch and consume after the fact. Um, we might argue that the new artifact does give us that, but um, the way it was published at the time, it felt like an unfolding in real time of these art forms in serialized mode. Um, and for me, they spoke to something that wasn't being addressed by many around me who I saw as basically sitting in silence while nonetheless the discourse was saturated with the pandemic. And it seemed to me that two worlds were emerging where there's a group of people who were concerned about what was going on or who were suffering disproportionately because of clinically vulnerable status or disability and a group of people who were able to move back towards a regular life or never really it seemed left that space. And I got the sense that Ernesto's interventions were not always, to be honest, wholly welcomed on social media. Um, they attracted less attention than many of his other tweets about the issues on which, which he speaks. People didn't want to hear much of what was being said, uh, which is worrying and I think still the case with the pandemic. But at least the visually appealing nature of what uh, he was doing by reinserting these statistics into visual context meant that I could thrust them in front of other people and, and make a bit of noise about um, what was going on. But I think um, the, the panel that, that is my favourite is the one from the 2nd of June, because it speaks to this nature of silence. Um, the panel I've chosen is the one that is four blank black squares. And I'm going to give a couple of readings of, of what's going on here. So the obvious reading, um, the one that's supplemented by the caption beneath, is that this took place during the well-known Black Lives Matters protest period during the pandemic, uh, the period when in the US there was the savage murder of George Floyd by a serving police officer, while in the UK we saw protests against monuments of imperialism that were torn down in Bristol and elsewhere around the country. That's the ostensible context within which we're operating here. But I think that this, this strip also acts as a kind of cynic doke for the entire situation where we have spaces of silence that are nonetheless speaking words. And we see people who are not saying anything, who have no content of their own to put forward, but are somehow nonetheless speaking about the pandemic. The language of blackness, for instance, is almost universally the language of mourning and death in many cultures. It's the way that we think about um, obliteration and annihilation. Um, although there's a curiousness in the history of the term white space, if you think about it, um, this is the term we use in computation and uh, text processing to think of blank space, when actually though, in the history of computer display screens, original screens were black with green text. 
So I'm not quite sure where white space as the term for blankness came from, but perhaps this black space is actually speaking quite loudly um, about the various silences and saturation also of our discourses. Because for me, the blackness is not just an emptiness, it's also a total overprinting. To achieve blackness on a white substrate requires overprinting to the point of obliteration, of saturation. And so these black squares, are, if taken as a reading of discourse about the pandemic, give us at once a space that's empty and underspoken, without content, without those voices coming forward. And while at the same time, it gives us the overloading and proliferation that we um, desensitized us almost to the constant news narratives and the constant daily updates of figures and mortality statistics and so on. I like this also because it does, means that I don't have to comment on, say, the particular use of a, a figure in some of the other uh, contexts. And one of the joys for me was figuring out what's the link between the, the statistics that Ernesto is taking and the current situation and the figure over whom he has uh, interposed these uh, text and, and speech marks. And my other panelists are gonna have the joy of trying to unpick, I suspect, some of the relationships between the figures who are speaking their words and the words that are being spoken. But for me, the, the characterless nature of these four blank squares um, also spoke to a message without a speaker and the many silenced voices of the pandemic over the last year and who continue on a daily basis to be silenced as today we registered another 293 deaths from COVID-19 here in the UK. So there's not a cheery end point, but it's not a cheery topic. Um, but I'm thankful to Ernesto for thinking this through, for coming up with an artistic response to a tragedy that lots was found very difficult to deal with and for continuing to speak messages that people don't want to hear, whether that's um, with Walter Benjamin at the top or in the silence of black squares below. Thank you very much. Brilliant, thank you very much, Martin, for that great insight. And Ernesto, were you showing it there in the spread in the book? It's nice, it's actually kind of nice to see that. I had, um, oh, it shows the one with just the numbers of deaths next to it as well. That's, um, I hadn't appreciated that because I haven't seen the physical book yet. I'm getting my copy this weekend. Yeah, there it is. Oh. Yeah, that's a, that's a brilliant spread. Okay, so next up we have Anna, who I believe is going to, again, share the physical object with us as well. So I won't have to share my screen, hopefully, but um, Anna, if we can hand over to you. Uh, I think you might be on mute. All right, I'm trying to just figure out how the camera works. Okay, let's see if it's gonna work, yay. Okay, so I'll go, I'll go here in, in reverse order, because I've got about five things I was gonna talk about. We'll start with the camera. I'm not sure how visible this is, but um, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about kind of geeky data things and about what it means to put statistics into comics. But so I so I thought I should pick as my as my example one that had um, statistics in it. But it was this one that was that's been haunting me um, since I since I read the book. Um, and there is a quote on this this speech bubble where um, he, he asked, the character asks, "We learn during the pandemic." that there are more things to admire in men than to despise. And so I've been sort of turning over in my head whether or not um, I agree or disagree with that statement, uh, both in terms of thinking about um, others in society as well as, as when I turn internally and think about uh, my own myself and my own kind of experience and wh whatever creature I am emerging as out of this. Um, and I think it was it's kind of this existential uh, here that so so my my last point, which will become my first point, is that I think it's quite interesting um, that there are these deep existential reflections that sit alongside of uh, the kind of stark reflection on death statistics. So this is a very good follow up to the first um, first presentation of a comic, um, and that takes me back to to my moral philosophy uh, beginnings in my undergrad, which means I am obligated to to tell you that I know Ernesto from our master's degrees and that I'm pretty sure I still forgot to give him back uh, some comics. Um, and I think you were probably one of the first people to introduce me to, to real comics uh, during our time at UEA together. So it has been uh, a great pleasure over the last two years to find ourselves back in the same virtual rooms uh, because I have been spending the last 
Um, I was just trying to figure out how many months it's been. I think nine months on the project, five months reading 15,000 Instagram comics on COVID-19, um, of which, well, with a team of people, um, of which we ha have hand coded um, over 3,000 in relation to the different elements of kind of data storytelling, info storytelling, public health messaging, and all of the kind of comic studies stuff as well around uh, the use of symbols in space and all those things. And I have actually just been wondering the same exact thing about where white space comes from, because we also are using that word. And I was like, I don't, um, but it's not always white. So I don't know how you make sense of that. So if anybody in here does know on white space. Um, so I'm gonna talk about now four things um, that have to do, uh, just they're kind of questions and statements rather than a sort of a talk. Um, that that came to my mind coming from this sort of data science comms perspective um, in reading this comic. So the first was about processes of re-archiving or layering the archive. And so I'm really curious when you talk to hear a bit more about your process for how you source the images, how you came across the ideas, um, they, they certainly don't seem like things that all come from similar archives. So there's a scattering that then gets collected back and re-archived into this now um, book, as well as into the, the kind of more ephemeral but archi digitally archived uh, versions on social media. Um, and I've, I have always find these kinds of things really interesting, but I, I think, uh, and this echoes what was just said, that there's something about the, there's something that is, very classical yet very new about what I think has happened here. And I've noticed in both some of the comics in our sample and also it just came back from, from Leakoff and Lakes and um, some of the really, really young artists there are doing this kind of very similar work where they're actually mining the past and then using kind of pastiches of old techniques to create this kind of collage form um, of mo modern comics. So I'm thinking of people like Zoom, I can't remember his whole name, but the Zoom guy who's doing this kind of um, paper puppeteering comics. Uh, and, and so there, and also the kind of Gen Z return to this interest in the historical archive. And so I'd, I'd just be curious to hear some things about that, which also in the same vein makes me think of number two, the memification of comics or comics as memes. Um, and this is again, something some of the young artists that we've been looking at have been talking about is that really, because they're feeding the social media algorithm by largely using Instagram for sharing their comics, they find themselves producing comics as memes. So intentionally creating these kinds of very short, quippy things that you can share over social media. Um, of course, most of those memes are colorful and positive uh, rather than as we were just hearing about from, um, from Martin, uh, a bit dark and, and less, um, less like your yoga affirmations, which probably get um, more positive responses on, on Twitter. Um, and I was wondering a bit about the role that Twitter plays throughout the comics. I really like the layering and of the tweet tweet um, into the images. And again, that kind of sense of layering and pastiche. Um, and then just hearing about a little bit of the social, the role that social media has played for you in being a, a, both a comics creator and commentator um, and living in, in, in largely in isolation. Um, and then third, I was thinking about how we embed data in stories and how the statistics become interwoven into the storytelling. And this is something, again, that's emerged in our very, very large sample um, as, as, a, as a best practice that rather than just reporting statistics um, to actually trying to weave them somehow into dialogue and story uh, and that you know, without being able, if we don't humanize statistical communication, then all we see is numbers and it's very hard for us to get a sense of lives. And here, interestingly, rather than giving the visual narrative to the statistic, you're giving voice to the speaking of the statistic, which I think is a slightly different um, way of thinking about what we might be able to do with comics um, and statistics uh, in terms of the fostering empathy and the kind of empathetic um, storytelling that comics are, are potentially um, so good at doing. Uh, and number four, which is really five, um, I was thinking about the running theme throughout of wealth, space, and home, and the very different kinds of homes that were being presented and the ways that homes were being presented as a means to talk about class. Uh, and I think one of the things that emerged there, that emerged in our sample, that has emerged you know, by living um, over the last 18 months, uh, is that how we feel about the pandemic is so bound up in the material conditions literally of our homes, uh, which is something that of course is always true, but has been so 
uh, so so kind of starkly reflected back to us, especially as we zoom into each other's homes so often. And I just was wondering a bit about some of the intentionality in that choice and in that returning constantly to both the both the kind of uh, again, the, the sort of statistical and the existential, the stark realness of things like the materiality of our economic conditions, um, and then also these layered with these kind of larger questions of, of whether or not we should uh, admire or despise man. Uh, so I'll leave, leave it at that. That's fantastic, Anna. Thank you. So, Ernesto, I'm looking forward to your response to all of that. There's going to be a couple more people to speak before you, so you have a little time to think, but there's so much really insightful stuff there. I, I particularly love the point about the humanizing effect that this kind of art has when you when you look at things like COVID death statistics. I mean, I don't know about you, but I still like to keep an eye on them. And even though it's kind of grim, I look at them every day. And to think about this kind of work and connecting it back to people throughout history, I, yeah, the, I hadn't realized how much of a sort of humanizing effect that that has. So that's a, that's fantastic, thank you. Um, so Francisco, um, if we can hear from you, um, as the designer of the book, it would be great to hear a little bit about that, as well as your favorite, um, your favorite strip from the book, I can show that. But yeah, a little bit about what the book means to you and the design process would be great. Thank you very much, Paddy. And uh, thank you, Ernesto, for having me here in this panel. Well, um, I think I first want to talk about a little bit about, about my relationship with Ernesto that uh, was born through comics. Um, I met Ernesto here in the UK. We, we are not friends from Mexico, but he's my Mexican friend in the, in the UK. And, uh, and we start a relationship uh, because we both uh, love comics and um, and the more I knew about him, the more I realized he really, really loves comics. <laughs> like he's probably the person that I know that uh, knows more on this genre. And um, so I'm really not impressed that he came out with these amazing strips uh, during the lockdown uh, that we lived last year. And I really enjoyed them. And I enjoyed them in, in, in many different ways. Um, I understand, as Martin uh, uh, said earlier, that uh, it is not an easy subject. It's not a cheer up subject, but um, um, there are many examples in, in, in comics where you don't have a, an easy or a beautiful um, subject. And even though you came out with beautiful objects like, uh, I don't know, I, I think about uh, Palestine by Joe Sacco or Mouse by Spiegelman or um, the work of Oliver Kugler uh, about the refugees, um, the Syrian refugees coming all the way from uh, Syria to Europe to the UK. And uh, all those examples, they, they show us uh, an incredibly difficult uh, situation in, in, in this um, media that allows uh, the reader to, in a way, um, jump in without uh, confronting uh, the reality in a horrible way. It's, uh, it's, it's like a, a perfect uh, thermometer to, to understand what is going on uh, without, uh, I don't know, suffering every time you open a um, a picture. That being said, uh, working with Ernesto on the design, it was um, a joy and a pain in the ass uh, in the same <laughs> level because he <laughs> he uh, loves the detail. He loves the the, the I don't know the, everything uh, has to be perfect and, and and you can understand where he comes from when you when you read the book because every strip is so. Um, uh, rich in, 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 I don't know, quotes, citations, uh, history. He, you, can, you, can, you can see that he knows what he's doing and he knows these characters and he knows the surrounding and the, and the, and the whereabouts. And, and then he put them in, 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 in the perspective of the, of the pandemic. So it's, it's an incredible, an incredible uh, job. And, 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 and then, um, I love the the format, the, the strip format. It's it's it. Uh, I grew up with it, and um, I believe Ernesto did as well. And and I think his um, 
main source of inspiration would be Charlie Brown, and he will tell me later if I'm wrong. But um, when I when I started seeing this uh, online um, last year, it, it took me back to to one of the Latin American classics um, of 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 comics who 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 is uh, the creator of Mafalda. Uh, Kino, who did all his work on on, on, on this particular character on on stripes, and uh, and I just loved it. So when he asked me to design the book, I was very excited because uh, I need the format. I don't have any any stripe book here um, uh, in, in in London with me. So um, so I just uh, think it's a it's a wonderful um, subgenre of uh, comics, the, the stripe. And um, finally, um, do you want me to share my screen to show you my favorite? Uh, or, if, or if you've got it there, yeah. Um, I think I got it here. I just need uh, permission. But um, can you, Ernesto, give me, thank you. So my favorite strip among others is uh, this one. Um, and uh, I like it because um, the character is a, it's a Mexican anarchist and revolutionary um, important uh, person who started the Mexican revolution in, in the early 20th century. It's uh, Ricardo Flores Magón and his, uh, he with uh, his uh, brothers um, they used to publish a newspaper called Regeneración, and, uh, and they started like um, telling people about uh, the horrible conditions. The dictator Porfirio Diaz at the time, um, who, who was like governing the country for more than 30 years, um, had the country in, and, um, and then they ended up in jail in, in, in the US um, later. But, um, I like this trip uh, particularly because um, he is in jail, as we felt uh, many times during the lockdown last year. And still, I don't know, these, these guys, they, they had the strength to, to come up with, um, with, with a newspaper, with, a, with this power that uh, ended up in an in a, in a armed revolution that changed the country forever. So I think it's a very clever um, move by Ernesto to to add uh, a character like this. It's uh, it was very unexpected as well. Um, so thank you very much, and um, we can talk about a little bit more of the design later with Ernesto. Sure, that would be great. But that was really really insightful, Francisco. Thank you so much. It's really really interesting that you highlighted the strip format as well. I think that's something that obviously really stands out to me, and is something that. As you say, you think it's like the strips that you read when when you guys were kids, and you know it's a, a format that is very accessible and enjoyable. And I think that's really central to the work as well. And I I love this one that you picked as well. That idea of you know of of revolution, I think, is something that's really important to this as well. You know, when the kind of in times thinking about other times in history that we've had historical upheavals, and to tie that into COVID, you know, brings a really really important perspective. So I'm really really glad that you highlighted that as well. Um, so next up we have Natalia, who I believe um, I believe you're gonna share your own screen as well. Um, Natalia with us, joining us all the way from Los Angeles. Yes, thank I you so already. much. That's just because I'm jealous. But. <laughs> okay, it's actually really uh, ugly and rainy here today. So it's not as awesome as it could be. So, okay. Um, thank you so much for having me, Ernesto, for inviting me. Um, Patty, thank you so much for um, introducing us all and everybody else, uh, audience, thank you for being here. Um, I'm going to start with a very short story, um, very personal story. And because it's, I'm trying to articulate the, uh, understand the articulation between the political and the personal that I it seems to me has broken apart in the past few years. Um, and yet, nevertheless, continues to cling to each other in very bizarre ways, but I'll start. Um, in early 2002, like most people, I had been following the um, 
evolution of the COVID outbreak in China. And like most people in the world, I have been following at something that was at the front of my mind, but that was happening over there and not here, uh, that I was immune to in some way. Um, and in those first days of March, something happened that I do not remember what it was, but I saw a news article that made, that scared me. And um, I decided to basically go pick up my child at school and initiate a lockdown by myself uh, in my own family. When I got to the school to pick up my child, it was very clear that the principal was just as frightened as I was, but had no um, resources to um, basically do anything, right? Um, the Los Angeles School District is one of the largest school districts in all of the United States. It includes some of the richest people in the world and some of the poorest, most vulnerable um, uh, as well. Um, uh, many, many, many um, undocumented uh, parents are here. So it's, it's, it's a difficult thing. Many people um, depend on the school for food and for childcare. So this caused like problems, of course. Um, and I'm sharing this story here for, for a couple of reasons. Um, the first is how fast social conditions change while our reactions um, to these shifts um, come about at a snail's pace. Um, second, how in times of crisis and fear, people tend to go inwards, um, literally locking down, but also thinking of themselves and, and their own personal experience over and over again. Um, I think we can see this in many of the stories we saw um, during especially the early months of the lockdown that were constantly this, like, how did I escape from Florida? How am I suffering this, et cetera, right? So that's two. And finally, uh, because as the, locked, as the lockdown has been lifted and the pandemic is slowly dying out, very slowly, we saw um, the New Yorker published yesterday that we have now hit 5 million deaths. Um, as we leave that moment that the event of the pandemic, it is becoming fuzzier and fuzzier to me what happened. Um, so it is in this context that I would like to talk about Ernesto Spiegel's very amazing The Lockdown Chronicles. And one of the things that I would like um, having that we have floating in the back of our minds in this is um, a question of us what the role of us as scholars, scholars of the humanities, and what the university should be doing now. I have no intention of answering this question, but I'd like that to be there uh, surrounding our comments and our uh, discussion today. Um, so one of the things that I found amazing about Ernesto's um, uh, Lockdown Chronicles is the use of um, the comic book strip that of course reminds us a lot of very many medieval forms of um, communication, uh, art and technology, such as um, block work. Um, and I have just an image I wanna share with you very quickly here. This is from the Cantigas. Uh, uh, and as uh, in case you don't know, this it, this was this is from the 13th century, and it is a um, a collection of miracles performed by the Virgin Mary. So as we can see, it seems this is a very um, old type of um, form of communication, uh, and this along with Ernesto's historical account of different moments of pandemics throughout or epidemics throughout history seems to tie in really well with the way. Um, we need to tell our story right now, our history right now. And this, uh, I, I just would like to mention really fast what Patty said um, at the beginning, how we have the, uh, the news cycle, and then we have forms of um, artistic representation, such as what Ernesto Prego was offering, uh, is offering. But we also have the event of the pandemic per se, right? That is the thing that we can never kind of um, approach completely, but that the, the, the news cycle and Ernesto Spiegos, the lockdown chronicles are sort of different forms of representing this pandemic event, right? But what I really like about Ernesto's form of approaching this is that on the one hand, he is connecting us to a history both of uh, discourse, the, the form, the comic book form, the comic strip form, but also all the other moments of um, crisis that we have had throughout history in this way. And that, therefore, at least for me, it felt really good to have a precedent for something that was completely unprecedented um, in my life, at least. 
Yes. Um, so seeing uh, this, although it presented a very bleak <laughs> uh, idea, um, especially the statistic aspect of it, the contemporary as the statistics aspect of it, the connection, the feeling connected to the flow of history was something that I found inc incredibly satisfactory at a moment where I was locked up in my house. And I, like Patty, I'm still locked up. I'm, I um, have, for medical reasons, I'm still inside my house. So it hasn't ended for me. Um, so that, that aspect I'd also like to talk about is like connection into the flow of history. Um, and one figure that I would like to use to think about that, and Ernesto, you present this, but it is not part of the Lockdown Chronicle volume one, hopefully there'll be a volume two, um, is the uh, sinking of the Titanic. And Ernesto, you use this to describe um, a moment of crisis and the subsequent um, fixing of legislation and uh, regulation in order for this not to happen again, right? But I was also thinking of a very negative form of the image of the Titanic that we have constantly, which is the idea of musicians playing on the Titanic as the Titanic is sinking, as the most useless of the useless, right? Um, I would like to argue that those musicians are actually the only ones doing what should be correct in that moment, um, which is recognizing the fear of a whole boatload of people and reacting to that fear. Basically what these musicians are saying is, I see your fear, I recognize your fear, and I can't do anything about it except calm you down, but that is something. Um, and if this is what we are as um, academics and um, humanists, are we the, uh, musicians playing um, on the sinking Titanic. But I really want to uh, impress that this is not, I'm not thinking of this in a negative way, but an incredibly positive way. Um, also that this idea of musicians playing in the Titanic is taking yourself out of uh, yourself as the important subject in this uh, equation and saying what is happening around me, which again, Ernesto, uh, was is, is doing this beautifully locked down in his home what he has access to is all of history and a huge internet archive and something can be done with that in spite of having no access to the pandemic event per se um, something can be articulated and narrativized in even in these moments of crisis um, and I don't know how we're doing on time okay great and this I would just like to close this with my favorite um, uh, 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 comic strip. And I'd like to hopefully be able to tie this um, to what I have just said. Let's see. Where are we here? Okay, um, mine is um, 19 April with Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz. Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz, as we know, lived most of her adult life inside a monastery in Mexico City um, and never left. Um, so one of the things I very much like about this comic strip, the, the 19 April, along with Emily Dickinson and Frida Kahlo, is the idea that many people, uh, for many people, this lockdown, this pandemic is not new. Um, they, for different reasons, um, women of color, people of color, women, um, the uh, chronically ill, etc., have suffered this containment for, for many, many uh, years before this pandemic. And what I find interesting and, and, uh, uh, and a link with what Ernesto, um, with Ernesto's uh, lockdown um, chronicles, is the fragility of the production that is uh, produced in these kind of situations of lockdown. Meaning Sor Juana Inés had no certainty that her work would live on. Um, uh, Frida Kahlo had no certainty that her work would live on. Like she, she, they lived such small lives in, in spatially um, and that this is what I found was happening um, with Ernesto's Chronicles. Um, the fragility of their production. Now we see them in a book form and I'm oh so happy, but for so long, this could have just been, um, you know, a, a, a file that Ernesto passed on among friends. Um, so this also, this fragility of production, not just of the subject position of production, but of that which is produced in these situations of crisis are something that I think I'd love to talk more about, but I will throw that out there. I think my time is up, so um, I will. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much, Natalia. That's wonderful. And thank you so much for sharing your personal story at the beginning there as well. I think, you know, the, this book as well has so many different personal stories embedded within it. And as you say, we have access to all of history and what that what that can give us is those kind of personal connections, I guess, with the book. And we've all shared our personal connections with the book, but also with the pandemic today as well. So that was a really nice thing to hear. Thank you so much. Um, Ernesto, I think it's it's time to hear from you now, finally. Um, so yeah, it'd be great to hear some of your responses to what people have said about the book. And if you have a favorite, I don't know what, which one, I think I do actually know which one your favorite is because I asked you in the the interview that I did for the Good Comics blog. But um, if you have a favorite, it'd be great to hear about that as well. Uh, thank you, Paddy, and thank you, everyone. Um, I'm speechless, speechless, really. Uh, I'm going to have a gulp of this beer. Uh, it's <laughs> seven forty one in the UK. Cheers, everyone. If you have a drink, um, cheers. Thank you yeah, so cheers. so much. Um, it's just humbling, really. I mean, I, I I of course I chose this panel because I knew that 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 Martin, um, Anna, Francisco, and Natalia were empathetic. <laughs> To the project that they had liked it, I invited them as well for <clears throat> different reasons because uh, they participated. They were parts of it in in different ways, and of course, Paddy, who basically has um, triggered this and uh, propelled it to a different dimension that I really did, was uncertain, uh, you know, would be possible. And I also have to thank Francisco for his encouragement to actually approach uh, Paddy, Sam, and. Rosie from Good Comics, so that they would distribute the this book, which has essentially been self-published by an imprint that an underground imprint that we have had uh, in our different homes, you know, in our existential spiritual home uh, for many years, publishing poetry chapbooks and uh, underground online publications that uh, uh, do not get much visibility. So this is probably the most visible project from that. Mansana imprint. <clears throat> so I will also like like to you know before I address the, briefly all of the very humbling again points that my colleagues and friends have presented. I would like to if you don't mind and you know I I I would like to say thank you to everyone who has come tonight. I'm sorry that we've asked you to have cameras off and all that. Um, pressure um you, you can turn them on if you want to um now just to get a bit like you know with you get some people get with get a bit epileptic with 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 flashing lights i sort of get <clears throat> i want to see everyone and then i can't and i get distracted because i am yeah as probably the lockdown chronicles show i'm very easily distracted um we have a variety of interests that traditionally have taken me in all, all sorts of directions so i would like to say thank you officially you know first uh, so i have mentioned already paddy johnston and sam williams and rosie hathaway from good comics sam, uh, francisco de la mora for his collaboration in different comics and and the, the very patient design work that uh <clears throat> we you know we did we did call yeah did we do co-design together uh he is incredibly flexible he's an uh you know a designer and as such he is but he's also an illustrator and a writer he's a creative person himself uh, and so we had conversations and lengthy conversations and we did prototypes and uh, spent money on printing uh, you know these prototypes and until the thing was more or less what we wanted it to be uh, it's still not totally perfect but uh you know we thought that um you know uh, that was the opposite of dawn so thank you so much francisco for your infinite patience to martin neve for having accepted to write the preface and you know he was an ideal reader all the time like like natalia martin was my where well, i mean you two guys were my ideal readers during the pandemic you know in the umberto eco sense of the ideal reader uh that the reader one one has in 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 their mind you know who will get the references and or will be uh you know critical where it needs to be and they 
provide their reading, their live feedback to the online publications of the, uh, you know, these trips, they're sharing them online, etc. cetera. Uh, you know, it was a lifeline during lockdown and while I was publishing this because the Lockdown Chronicle started as a, as a diary of sorts, right? They were being published in real time with the news of the day. So there would be headlines, you know, headline news on Radio 6, you know, in the breakfast show uh, in the morning, I would pick up the headlines and I would read, do more reading around it. And then I would immediately get the idea of this of a, of, for a strip. And then the research would follow and then I would put them together and I would, my, my, my plan was to publish them by 2 p.m. on that day. Obviously doing them daily was impossible, but you know, I, sometimes I managed to publish, as you can see from the dates of the book, if you get it, which you can buy now, by the way, from Good Comics. Uh, but he maybe wants to post the link on the chat. <laughs> um, uh, the, the, the date, sometimes they would, there was more than one strip on one week. Um, Anna Feigenbaum, uh, who I want to thank her for believing in COVID comics and, you know, taking it in academic terms, you know, uh, where, where no uh, male academic had taken them uh, before or any academic had taken them before. So I think her project uh, right now looking at Instagram comics is amazing. And, and uh, it is brilliant that, you know, thank you for your, your reading and your inspiration and your work about protest and stuff. So maybe I'm sure that you spotted some reference there as well in the book that, you know, what my, my upbringing was also defined by, you know, obviously my name is Ernesto. And even though it was not because of Che Guevara, like many people think uh, when I was growing up, I wanted to believe that that was the case. And then I read about Che Guevara and I wasn't that so happy about that. But anyway, the point is that, you know, like the 1960s protest and the protest folk song and punk rock and, and goth and punk and metal, and all things uh, dreary did, did and dreadful and horrible did inspire me as well. And, you know, horror fiction and speculative fiction, etc. So, uh, you know, I am like, I, all of those uh, themes are in my mind connected. I want to thank as well to Ira Frank, who's uh, 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 an, an academic as well. Uh, I don't know if she's here in the audience. Uh, I co-authored the, the strip that uh, Francisco mentioned, which is the Ricardo Flores Magón one. Um, uh, so that was a collaboration with her. To Puria Hadjari from the UK Health uh, uh, security agency for publishing the data in the UK data dashboard that was a lifeline and continues to be to the comics great people to my team at City University doing the digital comics research to Ian Cook from the British Library and Stella Wisdom from the British Library and Linda Berube and Stefan Macri HCID Simon Grennan and Peter Wilkins that that was really the seed uh, you know from you know I'm not someone like Simon or even Peter who draw uh, his own comics and that's you know that's what you know it was uh, what I what I wanted to do I, inspired by people like Damon Herd who is also a common friend you know with with Peter and and Simon was that anyone can draw but I wanted to take that to the level of anyone can do comics so you know if I can make comics you know I think anyone can do so if you have a computer so so Anna re referred to this in, um uh, you know about the process and asked about the or discussed the documentary uh, role, I guess, of the of the of, of the book. And, and and Natalia referred to to yes, I mean that the, the, you, you phrased it so well, Natalia, about be yes, being in lockdown and literally not going out except for a walk around the park, uh, but feeling like I have access to nearly like Borges's total library, mm -hmm. you know, that have having um, an amazing open archive at my fingertips. Not like Anna pointed out, not all of the sources come, you know, come from the same places. So uh, it was quite frustrating. You know, it was also an exercise in testing the limits of of online research and, and, and you know, uh, the, the book itself sort of pushes a little bit the boundaries. Uh, it's a bit like a risky exercise, just like people now risk it going out and doing things, knowing there is risk while well, doing this book was also uh, an exercise in, I suppose, copyright uh, licensing risk by, by, by invoking fair, fair, uh, fair uh, uh, use and fair dealing and applying, you know, creative commons licenses online. And then that would allow me to later, you know, present them in a different way. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the whole intention 
you know, I was very glad to hear it, it is humbling, but I must confess it is true that it was a conscious effort from my part to one, uh, have a <coughs> cast of characters that were as diverse as possible, um, to not shy away from the issues of the day that went beyond COVID, to do have some, you know, the first trip is about uh, Julian of Norwich and, 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 and like Natalia, I'm, I'm very interested in, in religion, mysticism, uh, and horror <laughs> and gore, <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> Julian of Norwich and, you know, and I will know, like having studied in Norwich, uh, you know, I, I read, I read, you know, the, the revelations of divine love while a student in Norwich. And, and, and I just thought about her, right? I thought, you know, how must have been like to be an anchorite in medieval England? And, you know, how did you survive? And, you know, the first trip is essentially a very optimistic trip. It is about, it, it ends with a panel that says everything is going to be well. So that would be the one I would choose, Paddy, you know, apart from the one I chose in the interview. Uh, that that it, start, it starts with everything is going to be well. And this edition collects only 40 because I did many more because it was like that first cycle of the first quarantine. You know, it's a quarantine of strips and it ends really just before, you know, just when things start looking a little bit better and then just everything just crumbles down, at least in the UK, because we are paid to go out and, and for other reasons. Um, and, and also another conscious thing was to, to go against what I perceive as a, as a very problematic uh, tendency in fiction, in, in, in identity politics, in, in ideas of self-care and public health, to, to make it all about the self, uh, you know, an idea that if I am well, then that's all that counts. And that the other, you know, other people may be toxic, so just get rid of them. <laughs> uh, what counts is that you are well. And and I sort of what I was trying to do, and you will see that after, you know, if you see my blog and you see my work, and if you go for the Lockdown Chronicles tab there, you will see that, uh, you know, many of those comics that are not in this book include me. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not exempt from that. Uh, uh, because again, I think this is a bit of a lockdown diary, but uh, I was trying to really think about how, what it was like for other people to have experienced something like this, what we could learn from that, and, and you know, to have people that would have lived before, way before the internet, you know, uh, imagining them blogging or reacting to the news on Twitter, um, things like that, to the point of, you know, where I guess, Martin is, you know, I moved that Martin chose the George Floyd uh, comic because indeed, um, you know, the white, that white space, at least the space between panels is known in, in you know, by some comic scholars, at least as the gutter, right? But <laughs> like a Scott McCloud term that, that made him call, you know, give the, his book, Understanding Comics, uh, the subtitle, The Invisible Art, because it refers to the space, with, you know, that comics is as much as by what it's not present than by what it, uh, because of what it, they show, it is also, it's the absence. And, and you know, obviously the gutter has a function of ellipsis, of, uh, you know, the reader understands that there is passage of time by what is not shown. So our minds do that closure. Unlike, you know, the, which works in different ways, you say in film or in video in motion motion arts. So I just thought that that point of that strip or the one where I, uh, you know, give the, the statistic, you know, it's a, the, the, the strip from the 6th of June, you know, where I just note, you know, 40,465 people have died of COVID in the UK. So that was at the time, 6th of June, 2020. As of today, uh, you know, people uh, who have died 28 days following a positive test uh, um, in the UK amount to 140, 969. And those, that goes up for about 20,000 if we consider just COVID in the death certificate. So at the time, you know, when I did that strip on six, the 6th of June of 2020, uh, you know, we had different ways of measuring this. and. Um, 
it was just uh, people who have tested positive. But, you know, it is amazing that horribly amazing, horrendously amazing, dreadfully amazing that it is more than 100,000 human beings who have lost their lives to what I see as a, as a, as a preventable, manageable, potentially manageable uh, situation. Uh, so yes, yeah, so I guess the main function was to try to document to to so that in the future perhaps someone could look back and 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 reflect in a kind of infinite mirror meta kind of way. Uh, in a, in but also essentially it was like uh, you know many people have used this metaphor of uh extending a hand right it was basically an sos sos it was like a bottle a message in a bottle and the thing now with social media is that you can metricate engagement and stuff so it does both encourage you to keep creating but it can also tell you you know it's useless there's no point um the attention economy now it's 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 ferocious so so without a publisher or a, you know an, an agent or a, a pr assistant it is very very hard to make any content reach you know you you know someone outside your very inner circle uh, so hopefully this print book uh, will reach a limited number of people that didn't know the comic online uh, who won't read it online or and and tell them something so that's i guess that that's me and i know it's almost uh 8 p.m but hopefully there's some time for questions if people can afford a little bit of time yes well i'm happy to hang around for another five ten minutes or so i'd, I'd say if you if you feel comfortable turning on your camera and unmuting then i i think absolutely why not um or if you if you like to type any questions in the chat and then I'd be happy to read them out. So yeah, please go ahead if anyone has any questions or anything else they want to bring up. But I just wanted to say, Ernesto, thank you for that. It was really, really moving to hear it from you, from your perspective. So obviously having read the book and looked at your strips, so much of it is very personal, but I'm, yeah, I think the most important thing for me that you mentioned was empathy. Um, and I think talking about other people's experience and saying the, there's a, as you say, there's so much talk about self self care today that, as you say, that it's easy to lose sight of the empathy that we need to have for other people to understand things like COVID nineteen, and especially when we we don't get that from the government and the leadership um, around this. You know, that we not having that empathy, it's so important to have that documented in art like this. So I'm really really glad you mentioned that, and that was one of the that was the thing that really stuck out to me. Anyway, thank you, Paddy. Thank you so much. Would anyone like to ask a question? I think I'll stop the recording now so people can feel like the, you guys can ask uh, uh, without being recorded for posterity and everything that that involves. So we Thank have you so much. in the chat, I see here.